times that occur. Well, that was kind of like trying to get a drink out the fire hydrant. <laughs> um, so members, you have her presentation, which included much more information than she actually had on the PowerPoint. I hope that you will take the time to look, look it over. Uh, our next uh, presenter is uh, Lindsay Burke. Really honored to uh, have the opportunity to get to meet her and have her present before our committee. Lindsay is a research analyst at the Heritage Foundation, and I'm sure we've all heard of the Heritage Foundation. She has uh, uh, been cited in numerous uh, uh, national magazines and newspapers across the country. She uh, speaks before uh, different audience audiences on Capitol Hill uh, about uh, local school choice. Uh, or education reform issues and uh, before coming to the Heritage Foundation she taught high school French. Say uh, la vie, is that French? <laughs> uh, and she earned her uh, bachelor's degree in politics from Hollins University in Virginia and a master of teaching degree in foreign language. Oh boy, it must really be a brain to I think you have to do that. A Master of Teaching Degree in Foreign Language University from the University of Virginia. And so I present her to you. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. And uh, I'm happy to be here today. Madam Chairman, members of the committee, thank you all for inviting me here to testify today. I'm excited to be in Oklahoma. No one denies that American education has room for improvement. American children ranked 32nd in mathematics among the mostly wealthy countries that participated in the most recent Program for International Student Assessment PISA test, falling below students in the Czech Republic, the Slovak Republic, Iceland, Estonia, and Slovenia. In all, just 33% of eighth graders are proficient in math. Moreover, a mere 17% of Hispanic students in America are proficient in math, along with just 12% of African American students. While U.S. math achievement is troubling, reading scores aren't much better. The United States ranked 17th on the PISA, following behind countries such as Belgium and Estonia. Today, just 30% of U.S. students score proficient in reading. And when we examine U.S. subgroups, the outcomes are even more troubling. Just 13% of African-American students scored proficient in reading on the National Assessment of Educational Progress, the name, also known as the nation's report card. Just 16% of Hispanic students can read proficiently, according to the test. And on international comparisons such as the PISA, black and Hispanic 10th graders in America score closer to their peers in Mexico than they score to the average for all of their classmates in the United States. But beyond international comparisons, right here at home, there's ample evidence that American education is in a state of crisis. Since the 1970s, academic achievement has remained relatively flat. Math achievement for 13-year-old children has increased only nominally, and reading achievement has been flat for the past 40 years. Not only has academic achievement remained flat, but academic attainment, that is graduation rates, have also been stagnant. Graduation rates today hover around 73%, essentially unchanged since the 1970s. And sadly, in many of our nation's largest cities, less than half of all children graduate high school. And there are other signs that American's education system is failing to meet the needs of millions of students every year. One third of students need remedial coursework when they enter college. And the achievement gap between white and minority children and between low and upper income students persists. And according to the newly developed Global Report Card, developed by the University of Arkansas and the George Bush Institute, quote, achievement in many of our affluent suburban public school districts barely keeps pace with that of the average student in a developed country. These failures have persisted despite significant growth in the federal role in education over the same time period. What began with President Lyndon Johnson's Elementary and Secondary Education Act in 1965 and the idea of compensatory education by spending taxpayer dollars through federal education programs quickly morphed into Washington becoming involved in systemic education reform. Instead of targeting federal dollars to low-income districts in an effort to improve outcomes for poor children, federal policymakers began creating education programs designed to dictate school policy. President Jimmy Carter's creation of the U.S. Department of Education in 1979 
resulted in the first cabinet level agency overseeing education, further entrenching Washington into the nation's education system. In the years to follow and throughout the 1990s, numerous niche programs were created, greatly increasing the size and scope of Johnson's original elementary and secondary education act. President George W. Bush's tenure included the eighth reauthorization of Johnson's ESEA, which in 2001 was renamed the No Child Left Behind Act. Over the years, Johnson's original ESEA grew from a mere 30 pages, it's really skinny, you can get a staple through it, $1 billion bill to the 600-page, $25 billion behemoth that is No Child Left Behind today. And over that same time, the federal role in education grew to such an extent that virtually no aspect of school policy is off limits to Washington now. Like so many prior administrations, President Obama believes that he can improve educational outcomes from Washington. The Obama administration believes that a ninth reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act is warranted, even though eight previous reauthorizations failed to improve outcomes. The administration also believes that national education standards and tests should be included in attempts to reform education. While many experts now examine the federal track record on education and conclude that decentralization, not further federal control, is more likely to improve outcomes, the Obama administration has not concluded that the federal role in education has failed. Instead of supporting idea, instead of supporting states as laboratories of reform, the administration has coerced states into the standardization of content, pushing a one-size-fits-all approach to standards and tests. Education Secretary Arne Duncan said in 2009, as the national standards push was intensifying, that, quote, the idea of having 50 states designing their own standards is crazy. American education is in a state of crisis. Stagnant graduation rates, persistent achievement gaps, low levels of academic achievement, and mediocrity on the international stage. The Obama administration believes that national education standards and tests are the way to improve outcomes. But nationalizing content taught in local schools tramples state educational autonomy, creates a one-size-fits-all approach to education, and will likely lead to the standardization of mediocrity, <coughs> not high-quality standards of excellence. The push for national standards and tests is not new, unfortunately. The federal government took an unprecedented leap into education policy in 1965, when Johnson signed ESEA. It was the education component of his war on poverty. While the idea at the time was compensatory education, that is, providing additional federal resources through federal programs to improve outcomes for poor children, by the end of the 1980s, education policymakers began to look beyond equity arguments to standards-based reform, known as systemic reform. In 1992, President George Bush provided grants to several organizations to develop common education standards. The grants came on the heels of a report by the National Council on Education Standards and Testing, a panel of policymakers and education experts which called for national standards. The standards were subsequently developed in U.S. history, English language arts, and mathematics, and came under scrutiny for the poor quality of the content. The U.S. Senate, after that, voted 99 to 1 in opposition of the history standards. The Department of Education canceled its contract with the organizations crafting the English standards and the math standards were widely criticized for promoting fuzzy math. President Bill Clinton signed Goals 2000 into law in 1994, marking the seventh reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, further entangling Washington into the nation's classrooms. Goals 2000 included broad goals as standards framework and required states to develop standards in reading and English language arts. While Goals 2000 required states to develop math and English standards, No Child Left Behind, the eighth reauthorization of ESEA was the first federal foray into testing. Building off of Goals 2000, NCLB now also required states to set standards in science as well as math and English, and began requiring states to test students in math and reading yearly in grades three through eight, and once again in high school. And for the first time, NCLB set a ticking clock on states. By 2014, all students would have to be proficient in math and reading as measured by adequate yearly progress. While No Child Left Behind significantly expanded the federal role in education by putting Washington in charge of setting student proficiency deadlines and by mandating the frequency with which states test students, current efforts by the Obama administration far exceed federal overreach that currently exists. 
and aim to get Washington into the game of defining content of what students are taught in local schools. To accomplish this goal, the administration has spent billions of dollars and provided incentives to states to adopt the Common Core State Standards Initiative. The Common Core State Standards Initiative began in earnest in the spring of 2009 with an announcement by the National Governors Association and the Council of Chief State School Officers that they would be supporting the development of Common Core Standards and Assessments. While the effort was supposed to be voluntary, states could choose to adopt the Common Core Standards in math and English language arts to replace their existing state standards. The Obama administration quickly became involved with the effort, creating question marks about the voluntary nature of the standards push. And I think it's important to walk through the timeline of the national standards movement as it relates to the Obama administration's education policy to demonstrate that the Common Core State Standards Initiative and the federal government have been in, become entangled both financially and program, programmatically. <coughs> in February of 2009, President Obama signed the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, also known as the Stimulus, into law, gifting an unprecedented $98 billion to the Department of Education as a one-time bonus. The race to the top program was carved out of the new stimulus funds and invited states to compete for $4.35 billion. Applications for race to the top funding ask states to describe how they would transform their standards and assessments to college and career ready standards that were common to a significant number of states. Well, the only common option available at the time was the Common Core State Standards Initiative creating an implicit endorsement, both rhetorically and financially, of the Common Core push, and further laying the groundwork for national standards and tests. Moreover, Race to the Top required states to join one of two testing consortia, crafting assessments aligned with the Common Core Standards Initiative. $350 million of Race to the Top was earmarked for funding of national assessments. Also in February 2009, the Council of Chief State Schools Officers met with Education Secretary Arne Duncan, and Vice President Joe Biden for a briefing on these stimulus, which included a discussion of standards and assessments. In May of that year, in a speech to the National Press Club, Education Secretary Arne Duncan was clear about the Obama administration's goals for the country. Quote, we want common, career-ready, internationally benchmarked standards, Duncan told the audience. In November of 2009, President Obama delivered a speech to students at James C. Wright Middle School in Madison, Wisconsin, his back-to-school speech. During his remarks, the president outlined the coming Race to the Top program, stating, quote, in the coming weeks, states will be able to compete for what we're calling a Race to the Top award. We're putting over $4 billion on the table, $4 billion with a B, one of the largest federal investments that the federal government has ever made in education reform. President Obama went on to say, quote, and I have to tell you, this was not an easy thing to get through Congress. This is not normally how federal dollars work. He went on to say, I want to commend the leadership of the governors and school chiefs who joined together to get this done. And because of these efforts, there will be a set of common standards that any state can adopt, and I urge all states to do so. By December of 2009, conservatives in Congress began voicing concerns that the Obama administration's support for Common Core standards of their support. Representative Glenn Thompson from Pennsylvania stated, the only common multi-state standards I am aware of are those being developed through the Common Core Initiative. Therefore, it stands to reason that any state wishing to receive funding through the Race to the Top program will be mandated to adopt the Common Core and to test its students based on those standards. In other words, he stated, Common Core is being transformed from a voluntary state-based initiative to a set of federal academic standards with corresponding federal tests. In February of 2010, Leaders of the Common Core State Standards Initiative announced that states that have adopted the Common Core Standards must use the standards word for word. National Governors Association Program Director David Wakelin stated, quote, you can't pick and choose what you want. This is not cafeteria style standards. Adoption means adoption. Education Week reported that, quote, NGA and CCSSO officials said that states must approve the entire Common Core Standards document verbatim. In February 2010, Education Secretary Arne Duncan told a group of governors that access to the nearly $15 billion in Title I funding for low-income school districts could also become tied to Common Core adoption. And in March of that year, the Obama administration released its blueprint to reform No Child Left Behind. The blueprint suggested renaming the Title I program 
for low-income children, the College and Career Ready Students Program. The blueprint states, following the lead of the nation's governors, we're calling on all states to develop and adopt standards in English, language, arts, and mathematics that build toward college and career readiness by the students graduate from high school. States may choose to upgrade their existing standards or work together with other states to develop and adopt common state developed standards. There was now clear evidence that the common standards would be supported in a significant way by Washington with the inclusion of a requirement for all states to have college and career ready standards that are common to receive funding from Title I, the largest pot of money provided under No Child Left Behind. And most recently, just last month in September, the Obama administration announced that it would offer No Child Left Behind waivers to states that agreed to conditions stipulated by the Department of Education. The first condition to which states must agree in order to receive a waiver is to adopt national standards and tests. The waiver application of the Department of Education's website says, over the past few years, governors and chief state school officers have developed and adopted rigorous academic content standards to prepare all students for success in college and careers in the 21st century. To receive this waiver flexibility, an SEA must demonstrate that it has college and career ready standards and at least reading language arts and mathematics. After the conditions-based waivers were announced by the Obama administration, Senator Marco Rubio sent a letter to Secretary Duncan expressing his concern about the waivers and the requirement for states to adopt national standards and tests. Senator Rubio stated that he is concerned with the waiver requirement that states, quote, adopt a federally approved college and career ready curriculum, either the National Common Core State Standards or another federally approved curriculum. Senator Rubio went on to say, I am also concerned that the U.S. Department of Education has created, through its contractors, national curriculum materials to support these common core standards. Such activities are unacceptable. They violate three existing laws, No Child Left Behind, the Department of Education Organization Act, and the General Education Provisions Act. All three laws prohibit the federal government from creating or prescribing national curriculum. There has been clear support, both rhetorically and financially, from the Obama administration for the Common Core State Standards Initiative. Attaching federal funding to the effort and creating federal requirements for adoption to qualify for federal funding has transformed the initiative from a federal push for national standards and tests to a federal push for national standards and tests that will define what every child in America must learn in school. Adopting national standards and tests would be unwise for Oklahoma for many reasons. Content matter experts, particularly math experts, have expressed concern about the rigor of the standards. Members of the Common Core Mathematics Advisory Panel said of the original draft standards that they would, quote, encourage the same kind of bureaucratic enforcement of state standards that has already damaged math education. The head of the Mathematics Advisory Panel also noted the rushed timeline for the standards and stated that, a normal timetable for standards adoptions would go through multiple iterations with pilot testing. The rush timeline is perhaps the reason that the holes in the mathematics standards have come to light. Zeb Foreman, a former senior policy advisor at the U.S. Department of Education and a member of the committee that crafted the California math standards in 1997, notes that the Common Core standards require only Algebra 1 in segments of Algebra 2 and geometry, geometry, despite the fact that most four-year colleges and universities require at least three years of math in high school, a minimum of Algebra 1, Algebra 2, and Geometry. In a December 2009 article, Worman and former Assistant Secretary of Education for Policy, Bill Evers, wrote, quote, in other words, students who graduate from high school having taken only the math coursework addressing those standards will be inadmissible to any four-year college around the country. Mr. Worman also points out specific problems with the skills measured by the mathematics standards. Worman wrote in the San Francisco Chronicle in December, the mathematics standards offer more than 100 examples of the, of the mathematics skills expected of students. Here's one example, and this is from the standards. If everyone in the world went swimming in Lake Michigan, what would happen to the water level? Would Chicago be flooded? So Worman goes on to state, quote, it's an interesting but mostly non-mathematical problem. The math skills measured are estimation and division at the fifth grade level, but how accurate is measuring even those low-level math skills when the answer depends mostly on non-mathematical knowledge? The Earth's population, Lake Michigan surface area, 
Chicago's elevation above the water level, or whether the water will spill over to Lake Huron before flooding Chicago. Out of the 105 examples, almost two-thirds have flaws of one type or another, making them inappropriate as reliable measures of math knowledge. This is deeply troubling, given these standards may shortly be imposed on the whole nation. There's also little, if any, empirical evidence supporting a move toward national standards and tests. Finding extremely limiting existing evidence on the efficacy of national standards, in 2009, the Brown Center on Education Policy at the Brookings Institution conducted their own analysis of the relationship between student math achievement at the state level and the, uh, and the rigor of state content standards. Brookings researchers found no statistically significant association between the quality of content standards and student academic achievement. The report concluded, the lack of evidence that better content standards enhance student achievement is remarkable given the level of investment in this policy and the high hopes attached to it. In a subsequent study, Brookings research conclu researchers concluded that the creation of common standards will have little impact on our future in and of itself. Proponents of national standards also frequently argue that nations that outperform the United States on international tests of student achievement have national standards. While many countries that outperform the U.S. on international tests do have national standards, so do many of the countries that do not outperform the United States, including Belgium, Australia, and Canada. These countries have education systems that are decentralized, yet often outperform the United States on international tests of student achievement. And indeed, the best way the United States can improve the quality of standards is to decentralize the process of, study, of setting standards and assessments. According to education researcher Dr. Jay Green at the University of Arkansas, when we have choice and competition among different sets of standards, curricula, and assessments, they tend to improve in quality to better suit the needs of students and they result in better outcomes. Concerns have also been raised about the subsequent process of maintaining and updating the standards which has yet to be determined. National standards are likely to become rigid standards that are difficult to change and adapt due partly to questions of ownership. Who will ultimately own these standards? Who will update them? Who will maintain them? Professor Green, in testimony before the US House Education and Workforce Committee last month, warned, once we set national standards, curriculum, and assessments, they are nearly impossible to change. If we discover a mistake, or wish to try a new or possibly better approach, we can't switch. We are stuck with whatever national choices we make for a long time. And if we make a mistake, we will impose it on the entire country. While some states certainly have low quality standards, some states, such as, such as Massachusetts, have exceptional standards that are internationally competitive. While there is variation in state standards, the rigor and content of national standards will face pressure to scale down toward the mean among states undercutting states with high quality standards. Therefore, centralized standard setting will likely result in the standardization of mediocrity rather than establishing high quality standards of excellence. Another argument that proponents of national standards and tests often offer is that such standards will ensure parents can understand how children are performing relative to other children across the country. Before assuming national standards will provide parents with useful information about their child's performance, we should consider what types of information parents need about their child's school success. Parents need two critical pieces of information to determine whether their child is excelling in school. First, parents need to know whether their child is mastering content appropriate to their grade level. And second, parents need to know that when their child has mastered fourth grade content, for instance, that they're on pace with other fourth graders across the country. To provide information about content mastery, States currently conduct criterion reference tests, which measure students' mastery of the content outlined by the state standards. To provide information about how rigorous the content is compared to other states across the country, many states also conduct norm reference tests, which measure student achievement compared to other students nationally. Moreover, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, the NAEP, uh, acts as an excellent audit of state standards, providing a common gauge for quality. Meaningful information about student achievement already exists. No Child Left Behind required every state to issue report cards to grade school systems. What has been missing, in some instances, is transparency about that data. But inadequate access to information does not justify a national standards and testing regime. 
States should focus instead on supplying clear information to parents about school performance. So if not national standards, how does Oklahoma improve outcomes? First, strengthen state-based accountability systems by strengthening state standards and tests. Then provide school performance information to parents and taxpayers by publishing state standards and cut scores in a matter that is accessible to parents. And finally, empower parents to act on school performance by offering more school choice options. The problems that need fixing in American education are rooted in a misalignment in the power and incentive structure of public education. Focusing on the adoption of national standards and tests to define what every child in America will learn distracts from fixing the fundamental deficiencies of our education system, a lack of choice for families, and the absence of competition to force schools to improve. Centralizing standards and assessments will not improve educational outcomes. American education has long prided itself on the principle of local control, and for good reason. Those closest to the student know them best. A half century of ever-increasing federal involvement in education has failed to increase academic achievement. Relinquishing control of Oklahoma's educational autonomy to distant bureaucrats in Washington by adopting national standards and tests will fail to improve educational outcomes for children and it will further remove parents from the decision-making process. National standards would strengthen federal control over education while weakening schools' direct accountability to parents and taxpayers. Moreover, states are far better at adapting and innovating than bureaucratic federal government. Ten years ago, we could have never envisioned the technological advancements that have taken place, such as the iPad, and we cannot imagine what will take place ten years from now. I hope Oklahoma will lead the way in its proving its, its own education standards and pushing back against this unprecedented federal overreach from what is taught in your local classrooms. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation.